plastic deformation and we saw that plastic deformation mostly occurs in materials by the slip motion or the dislocation and when these dislocations begin to slip in the material, they also begin to multiply in number in the case of solid. The stress required to make the dislocation slip, we refer to it as critical result shear stress. And now we shall begin to see how is it possible for one to resist the slip motion of the dislocation, thereby increase the critical result shear stress, or in other words, increase the yield strength of the material. These are referred to as this various strengthening mechanisms in materials. And first of all, we shall look at the strain hardening. Strain hardening, as we have seen in the tensile test, that when plastic deformation occurs in the material, after a certain amount of strain, if you want to further deform it, or further strain it, you will have to apply more stress. Now, when a dislocation is causing the, slip, uh, the deformation of the material, suppose I have a crystal like an HCP material or HCP crystal, where the slip planes are only hexagonal planes and they are all parallel. Therefore, once a dislocation or a fine charge begins to operate on one of the planes, that continues to operate and dislocation one after the other keep going onto the surface and keep causing the plastic deformation in the material. There is no problem in such situations. If there is another fine plate source also operating because it is also the same size but lies on a different slip plane, that is also possible. The two fine sources will not interfere with each other. Stress will remain the same. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There is no strain hardening basically taking place there. That is what I am trying to hint at. Because nobody is able to resist the motion of the slip motion of the dislocation. So there is no strain hardening whatsoever. It goes on at a constant level of stress. That is, the result is just required to operate the fractured source, and that fractured source keeps operating. We recall that fractured source requires depending upon its size, the length of the fractured source, it requires the stress. However, slip planes are not parallel in all crystals, FCC and BCC. FCC has a family 111, which have four members which are known parallel. BCC has 110 family, or six known parallel members. And such slip planes do intersect each other. There is a common line, common direction. If they are not parallel, they will intersect in space. In the crystal itself, they will. And suppose there are two flanked grid sources operating in two such planes which are not parallel to each other. What shall happen? That's what we shall look at the, in the strain hardening. Let's say I have an FCC crystal. This is a 111 plane on which some fine grid source is operating somewhere here. And going out loops after loops like this. And there is one 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 bar one plane and the fine grid source is operating somewhere there. And it's giving loops after loops. These two planes intersect at this line, the green line, and the leading dislocation from this source reaches here and the leading dislocation from here reaches here. When they reach together here, the, there is an interaction between them. The dislocation line is a strain field along the line in the crystal. Two strain fields always will interact if it is possible for them to lower the free energy. 
and I am showing you one such reaction. Not always such thing can happen. Half 0 1 bar 1 is the bogus vector, the dislocation which lies on this plane. Half 1 0 1 is a bogus vector of dislocation which lies on this plane. Or the fact it shows that is operating there. That is the bogus vector. These two bogus vectors means the two strings will add up and give me the resultant strain of the green line, green dislocation line. And this is half 1 means 0. You see the magnitude of the bogus vector is the same. So, energy of the two dislocations has become equal to the energy of one dislocation when they interact like this. And some energy is lost. It's an energetically favorable process. All right? But when I get a dislocation like this formed with the bogus vector half 110, check whether this dislocation line can slip on 111 plane or it can slip on the 11 bar 1 plane. Because there is enough result shares on this, there is enough result shares on this. Can it move on any one of those planes? It can continue moving on this or it can move, uh, continue moving on this one. Is it possible for it to? What is a slip plane? Slip plane is defined as the one containing the T vector and the D vector. This is the dislocation line that is the T vector. And this is the D vector. Both lie on the plane. This is the slip plane. Now, 110 does not lie on 111 plane. 110 does not lie on the 11 bar 1 plane. So, the resultant bogus vector is out of these two planes. And therefore, there is some other plane on which this dislocation line lies now. It does not lie on this slip plane, it does not lie on that slip plane. And on the third slip plane, I may not have enough resultant stress. And this dislocation will not be able to move at all after this. If there is no result shares, enough result shares is there, and I call it an immobile dislocation. And immobile dislocations are also called seesaw dislocations. They cease to move. And all these dislocations which are moving, which are slipping, are called seesaw dislocations. They are gliding. Forces operating on two non parallel slip planes, it is possible for me to form immobile dislocations. Once this immobile dislocation is formed, dislocation coming, any dislocation coming from behind here will be obstructed by this. It will not allow it to slip further. And similarly, any dislocation coming from this will be stopped by this. And as a result, there shall be a power of dislocations starting from here right up to the fractured source. It will be a pile of dislocations starting from here right up to the fractured source. And these are all dislocations the same sign. Starting from the fractured source till this leading dislocation here, they are all of the same sign. They start repelling each other. And this is not allowing it to move further. So, they cannot push this one out. Because this is resisting its motion. And as a result, there is a back pressure under the fractured source, and fractured source stops operating. It does not produce any more loops, it does not produce any more dislocations. Now, you will have to apply a hard stress, maybe to operate a smaller fractured source which lies on some other plane. Because this one is, this fractured sources are becoming inoperative. And that is one explanation for the same hardening. Now, you have to operate a small fractured source, and for a small fractured source, you have to apply more stress. Tau is smaller, so tau will be larger. You have to apply more stress, right? That is one explanation for strain hardening. So, I said this is called a system dislocation, and this is a pile up right up to the fractured source, 
in the pile of the first dislocation is always called the leading dislocation. And the rest of them are trailing dislocations. Leading dislocation is being pushed by the trailing dislocations. And this is being stopped by the sessile dislocation. The empirical model will find out As we deform the material, the dislocation density in the material goes up and the relationship of the result shear stress or the critical result shear stress for making the dislocation slip is a linear function of the root or under root of the dislocation density. Here, rho is the dislocation density and dislocation density you know is expressed as length of the dislocation line per cubic meter of the crystal, right. T is a proportionally constant, our units are Newton per meter and tau 0 we refer to as the basis stress. What is this basis stress equal to actually, physically what does it mean? When is the critical result shear stress equal to tau 0? No dislocation is a perfect crystal. It is a perfect crystal. And the perfect crystal is made by such very high already. But how is it increasing by our uh, strain hardening is taking place? We should not forget that we always said that plastic deformation in a material is caused by the slip motion of the dislocation. So I have to refer to the slip motion of the dislocation. So this is the stress required to slip a dislocation in absence of any other interfering dislocation in the crystal. Whenever there is an interfering dislocation, the density there should be formation of this all dislocation or anything. So, when there is no interfering dislocation, the single dislocation keeps slipping without problem, that is what is called the basis stress, okay. That is result shear stress required to slip a single dislocation. in absence of all other interfering dislocations. So, this is only an empirical relationship, this, you can see the dislocation density is more there will be more interactions possible and there will be more formation of sessile dislocations, okay. Right. So, that uh, the effect of uh, cold working or strain hardening we have also seen in an experiment and if we give you the material which is cold worked, maybe its yield strength has gone up but it may not give you the percentage of in tensile test as much as undefined would have given. If you define it more, it may be using may go still up, but the percentage of it gives before the failure will be less, that will keep decreasing. That means materials while becoming stronger is becoming less ductile, becoming less and less ductile, okay. That is usually the case when material becomes stronger generally it becomes less ductile or it becomes better. Now, let us look at the other mechanism which increases the strength or resists the motion of the dislocation that is the presence of green boundaries in the material means a polycrystalline solid. Of green boundaries, what 
is a game boundary. I have a crystal 1 here, I have a crystal 2 here, that are green. These two have a different orientation. <laughs> Let's say I have shown a slope plane, if the FCC material 1, 1, 1 plane is here, another second crystal, the 1, 1, 1 plane is a different orientation. The orientation is different between two other crystals, they are not parallel. If they are parallel, this will not be the boundary between them. It would be the same crystal there, right? But these two crystals have a different orientation, therefore I have a boundary. Now when a uh, frag grid source is operating somewhere on this frag grid source, or on this uh, slip uh, slow plane, here, it is given rise to loops after loops, and this is the loading dislocation here. And a pile up is found. When it comes here, he doesn't know where to go. It's a game boundary, and this slip plane doesn't continue in the solid. It gets obstructed in the game boundary. Now, as a result, this is a game boundary, and this is obstructing the game boundary. Well, if something can be accommodated, it will get lost, but then something else will come. So, therefore, there is a loading dislocation here which is obstructed by ultimately the game boundary here. It doesn't know where to go. And as I said, all the dislocations of pile up are all of the same sign. I have shown them all positive edge dislocations. Somebody who has shown them all positive screw dislocations. And they are repelling each other. So, the maximum stress, when she has applied this stress, then she has stress to apply this fragmented source, let us say like this, there shall be the maximum stress under this. And is trying to push it out, that maximum stress, because all the dislocations are pushing it out. They are all repelling. And in turn, this is, this is they are all repelling each other, and the fragmented source is getting obstructed. Right? But let us look at the situation. This stress onto this loading dislocation. Loading dislocation means this region, the stress, which is being applied by this, all the dislocations of the same sign here. They are doing this. And it is like you are standing in a queue. Depends upon the length of the queue and the push when it comes, the person in the front is the one who is going to fall flat. And standing in front of the counter will topple over the counter. It's a question of how much push is coming. If there are 100 people, there will be more push. If there are 50, there will be less push. So, in other words, depending upon the number of dislocations in the pile up, depends upon the stress which is developed here. If the number of dislocations in the pile up is more, no stress is developed here, number of dislocations in the pile up is less, there are less dislocations of, <coughs> or less stress is developed here. Now, what dictates the number of dislocations in the pile up? The distance of this leading dislocation denotes the grain boundary from the Franklin source. The distance from the Franklin source of the grain boundary is more, there will be more dislocation in the pile. If the distance is less, there will be less number of dislocation in the pile. So, if the distance is shorter, there will be less stress developed here. A concentration of stress, I should say, will be less. If there are no distance, there will be no stress developed here. And of course, whatever the applied stress, the result shear stress is here, which is making the fracted source operate, that is what we have applied. If that is more, that concentration will also be more. Okay? Or the concentrated stress level will be more. So, it depends upon two things the applied stress and the number of dislocations of the pilot. Let us say there is a certain value of stress required here, so that the reserve component is good enough for the dislocations to move onto the slip plane. So, plus the formation will be continued onto the neighboring grain, and it can provide more space for these dislocations out of the move. So, the plus the formation would continue if it continues in neighboring grains. Otherwise, it was stopped here itself, and you will not see the plastic deformation externally. 
So I need a certain level of stress here so that stress on this becomes enough and the dislocation begins to slip on this plane, which may be present in this uh, crystal here. Let's put a name here green. What is the dislocation or is the slip plane for green? What is the slip plane for that? The, see, the, the stress you are applying may be a tensile stress or sometimes a compressive stress. This becomes a result shear stress of the slip plane. So, meaning it is possible for that to become a result shear stress of the slip plane. And that's what is needed to make my dislocation slip on this. Then I need a certain value of this concentrated the value here, which will depend upon two things as I said. Number one, the applied stress. And second thing, it depends upon the number of dislocations in the pile up.
is the green diameter.
So this thermal mechanical treatment which we do for low carbon steels, so called high strength low light steels.
and I've shown here is the biggest substitutional in solute atom in the matrix and it causes a change in the neighboring grains here. Sorry, in the neighboring uh, atoms and the electron clouds are strained in this region. So, in the smaller one, neighboring grains or uh, neighboring sorry, atoms, you can see these ele electron clouds are strained. So, they are stretching there to form the bond with the solute. So, as a result, there are strain fields in the matrix around the solute, or strain fields in the matrix around the solute, and they are localized. These are point strain fields, I can say that. But they are the point defects, I can call them point strain fields. deformation takes place by the slip motion of the dislocation. So, it is a moving dislocation. What is a moving dislocation in a solid or it is a crystal? What is a moving dislocation? It is a moving strain field because there is a strain field all along the length of the dislocation line. Be it the shear strain, be it the tensile strain or be the, the mixed dislocation, the general kind of strain mixture of principal and shear stains are there. But this is a localized point stain field. Right? So, when a moving dislocation comes near the stain field, that is a moving stain field, that is a stationary stain field. And when they come together, close to each other, there is a interaction between them. If the two strains stain in the dislocation and the strain around the solute are of the same kind, there will be repulsion between them because when they come together, strains will add up and will go as a sum, square of the sum. So, in that region, that localized region, there shall be an increase in energy. So, there will be repulsion between them. To overcome that repulsion, you will have to push the dislocation close to this, you have to apply more stress. That means that additional energy you will have to provide from the external source. And the source is the one which is making the dislocation slip. So, applied stress will go up. But once it has come close to it, getting away from this will be easier. Because getting away means strings are separated and energy will be lowered. At that stage, energy will be lost in the form of heat. But beyond the this location close to this itself is going to be difficult. Let us say I talk of a different situation. The two strains are of opposite in nature. Moving this location and the point field of uh, the solute. Therefore, they, once they come close, they will be attracted because strains will be reduced. Opposite strains, they will be reduced. Strain energy will be reduced. And that energy which is lost as waste as heat in the material. And then gets dissipated to the atmosphere. Now, when you want to make the dislocation slip further, because plastic deformation will be complete, only when the dislocation is gone out. It has to move from this point. It has to move away from there. To make a move away from here, you will have to now apply more stress because the energy will have to increase that energy. But, so therefore, whether the interaction is attractive or the interaction is repulsive, either way, you have to at some stage apply most energy, also apply more energy to the system, is do more work, you have to apply more stress. And that is the increase in strength of the material, because critical resolution stress goes up by that much amount. And once you reach that level of stress, you don't decrease that stress. So, you have to apply that stress and that is the increase in strength in the material. Now, this increase in strength depends upon well, that is what I already discussed. The same type of strains, they repel each other. So, bringing them closer is going to be more difficult. And opposite strains attract each other, taking it away will become more difficult. They will get attracted and they are taking it then uh, the dislocation taking away from the solute will become difficult. Now, the problem 
much I'm trying to make is how much or what controls the amount of stress you need to apply. While still feel intensity around the salute. The steam field intensity is more, interaction is going to be stronger. And that is decided by the size difference of the solute and the matrix atoms, the solvent atoms. Solute atoms and the solvent atoms, how, differ, they, uh, how much they differ in size or the radius will dictate the size difference and will cause this strain around the solute. That will be all right if I say, the modulus of elasticity of the two, the solute and the solvent are the same. But if I say the modulus of the solute is very small, negligible as could be the modulus of the matrix. So, what can happen is, stop back. Then this electron coil is more compressible than this. Or I'll say that this has a lower modulus. That means this is compressible, more compressible than this. So all these strains will be taken up by the electron coils of the solar and it becomes of the same size as this parent atom. That means all the strains are in the solute. If such a situation exists, can a moving dislocation see that strain? It will not see the strain. Right? And therefore, I don't have any such material which has almost zero modulus. Nothing is there. So therefore, there will be some strain in the solute and some strain. On the other hand, also it could consider that if these parent atoms have a very low modulus, if that is a very low modulus, then all the strains will be in the matrix. There will be very high strain. Even that is normal not the situation. But we are really, really looking at the relative modulus of the solute. If the solute radius or the solute modulus is not definitely there will be more strain field. Right? That's what we are worried about. The solute which is added has relatively high modulus should provide more strain field. Right. So, here are two things. I need the size difference should be large for large strain field and relative elastic modulus should be higher for the solute. And thirdly, along the length of the dislocation line, at how many places the interaction is taking place? If there is a small concentration of the solute, what is it? One percent? Maybe four places. But if it is ten percent, a large number of places the interaction will take place. So the concentration of solute is the next thing. So basically, the steam field depends upon these two things. And the concentration of solute depends upon how much solute you have added. Right? But the, both these factors, the size difference and the concentration, are against each other. What can do in solution should be less than 15 percent size difference if I want extensive solubility. But if size difference is more than 15 percent, I will have very limited solubility. We want to know these rules. Up to 15 percent, possibly I can have extensive solubility. And if it is more than 15 percent, solubility will be restricted. So they work they against each other. I want to add more so concentration, size difference should be smaller. My side difference is smaller, steam field will be smaller. So if I want to increase both, I will have to make a compromise somewhere. 
and this is what is shown here in the alliance of copper when I have different aligned ele uh, uh, elements what happens this is I have here let's say yield strength and this is the percentage solute let's say for the pure copper, we will start for the pure copper. When I add zinc to it, the copper has a radius of 1.28 angstrom, these are the radii in angstrom. And zinc is 1.31. When I add brass, I mean from brass, copper and zinc, I can add up to almost 40% zinc to copper solute. That can go on, but the slope is smaller. This slope is very small. For the same size, if you nickel with 1.25, slope is larger than that for zinc. This is nickel. And see, the color is the same as written here. Right? So, with the same size difference, nickel gives me more slope. And I can dissolve nickel up to 100 percent. Well, but 100 percent adding doesn't mean I increase the strength or the modulus or the strength of the material. It's the alloy which I'm making about the strength is going up. But now we are talking about the slope. Why is the slope for nickel is more than that for zinc? So the difference is small. How the phase is same, 1.31, 1.25, 1 is a, uh, into uh, this thing, smaller solute, there is a bigger solute, smaller solute gives the tensile strains, bigger solute gives the compressive strains, strain field intensity is the same, is it? Strain field intensity is not the same, reason is the elastic modulus of nickel is more than that of zinc, and therefore it gives a more slope than the zinc. Does no? zinc has a lower slope than the nickel? Similarly, I put a similar size difference called thing 1.43 and 1.18. 1.43 is aluminum and 1.18 is silicon. Silicon has a higher model than aluminum. Similarly, here this is beryllium and this is tin. Tin, the size difference is very large. Bronzes are stronger, not much stronger than the brasses. Copper tin alloys are not much stronger, but the tin amount of tin you add is not more than 5 percent. It doesn't go in the solution. That is also in the metal solid state. The equilibrium diagram says you can't even dissolve that much amount of tin to copper. But uh, below 400 degrees centigrade, it is not easy for tin to diffuse out. And it's very, very long time. So, bronze can remain in so, uh, the zinc, uh, tin can remain in solution up to about 5 percent. And I cannot dissolve 40 percent like I can do that in zinc. I cannot have a small quantity, but then increases that small quantity also increases the strength very much. Right? So that's the effect on these three, three things, size difference and the modulus. Secondly, the amount of concentration. More the concentration you added, more is increasing strength, you can see that. And for small class, uh, amount of solutes added, it goes linearly. But ultimately, it will become a parabola because the other side also it has to go back, you know. Somewhere in the middle, the strength will be the highest, and again it goes back to uh, then the solute becomes a solvent at that stage. All right, these are the three strengthening mechanisms which we have talked about. Strain hardening or work hardening, that's a cold working. When you deform plastically the material, more difficult it will be for the dislocation to slip. A top the money grain size, final grain size, how the strength of the material, and solution strengthening. Now, in solute, you can put this uh, solute uh, solvent or in the matrix, more will be the strength. 
and also the size difference is large, there will be no, no strength of the material. Now, these are the three mechanisms, all three are working in one single material. We are talking of modernite. Modernite, all these three are working. Fourth one we shall discuss in the next class, show you that also is working in the steel when I attempt to the modernite. Let's see how it is working, steel hardening in modernite. I told you, modernite forms are in the form of lats or in the form of plates. When it forms in the form of lats, <laughs> lats are heavily dislocated. The high dislocation density means high stain hardened material. And when it forms in the form of plates, there is a high dislocation density in the austenite as well as inside the plate at the near the interface. There is a grain refinement, these particles are forming, lats are very small in size, thickness of the order of 50 angstrom, 50 to 100 angstrom, lats have much small thicknesses, and these plates are forming, they are forming more interfaces, and therefore providing for more presence of interface of the boundaries. Grain refinement is taking place. Also, in the plates we have seen, let me make the plate like this. Bigger section. In the middle, this is the middle plane, we find that there are presence of twins. Each twin is again 50 to 100 angstrom thick. Twin boundary is also again boundary. It also stops the motion of the dislocation, like any other boundary. Orientation on the other side is different. I have to have enough associates for for dislocation to move on to the next. Crystal. So, therefore, these act as grain refiners. Grain boundaries are added by these. And then, all the 0.8% I consider a case of a liter third steel, all the 0.8% carbon is in solution in matter site. It's not even to out. No carbon is formed. So, everything is in solution. Then, solubility at room temperature of carbon in iron is only 0.002%. When I have 0.8 percent, all of it in solution. So, solution strengthening is also taking place. So, all these three mechanisms are working there, and therefore, the strength of the mother side and its hardness is very, very high. All right, we should look at the next one in the next class.